five. Good morning, everybody. Y buenos días a todos mis amigos de Argentina, de Bolivia, de Chile. ¿Dónde están? Están aquí. De Colombia, de Costa Rica, de Cuba, de la República Dominicana, de Ecuador, del de Salvador, de Guatemala, de Honduras, de México, de Nicaragua, de Panamá, de Paraguay, de Perú, de Uruguay. Puerto Rico, España, Portugal, Brasil, Venezuela y Belice. ¿Cómo están? That was uh, Spanish for hello, right there. I want you to tell the person right next to you, have you heard? And now lean into the other person on the other side and ask them, have you heard? We all learned a lot of new things during COVID. Um, one of the things that happened in LA was all the barber shops closed down. And so we had to learn how to cut our hair on our own. And um, I got pretty good at it. It's not perfect. In fact, I made some mistakes three weeks ago and was hoping there was enough time between then and convention for my hair to grow out enough to not look horrible. But even though I know a little bit about it, enough to get by, it saves some money, um, somebody in my church came up to me and they said, hey, 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 Jeff, you're doing a really great job cutting your hair. Could, could you cut mine too? And I said, uh, no, I, I have no plans to become a barber. I'm a pastor. And um, I'm okay with ruining my own hair. I am not okay with ruining anybody else's. And you know, I've learned that the reality is, is that we, while we can learn from others and we can grow in a lot of things, there are specific things that God has called us to. Unique things that, that God has for each and every one of us that he has for nobody else to do. You have a unique call of God in your life. He has not called me to cut people's hair, but he has called me to preach, to train people, to raise disciples, as all of us in this room have been called to do as well. Is anybody with me on that? But you know what, I, as I've been thinking about where we are in this season of life, and how much time we spend, whether it be on social media or any news sources or, or reading books and articles and, and attempting to figure out what is going on in the world and how we're supposed to do ministry and what we're supposed to speak on and, and what we're supposed to do. And, and, and a lot of times, and I know this because it happened to me, we end up confused. Where we have so many sources of information, so many things that are coming at us and we're not quite sure what we're supposed to do. We're not quite sure what we're supposed to say, how we're called to speak. And then I wanna bring a challenge to everybody here today that God is calling us back to listening to his voice. And you know what, to know who we are in him and to know what he is asking us to do we, we look around and there's so many methods and systems and strategies and we wonder, do you do seeker sensitive or attractional or missional or liturgical? And we look at society and we see all the trends and all the different things and the questions that are happening in politics and everywhere else and we're wondering, what am I supposed to do? And there's a lot of voices and a lot of voices are out there forming what, what I would say is a new style of legalism that is requiring of you to say a certain thing or to respond a certain way, to act a certain way or to do certain things. And as Shonda said yesterday, free yourself. Free yourself. I was talking to um, Pastor Jerry Dearman and as I was speaking with him, I, I was thinking about the fact that we end up so busy, focused on tons of models for church and so many different things and wondering what we're supposed to do, but maybe not busy enough making disciples. Disciples, people who know the voice of the Lord and walk closely with him. 
And, and I wanna say something before I get too further into this. I, I'm not speaking as a person that has it all figured out or a person that is coming in some type of you know, judgment or, or criticism or accusation. No, no, not, not even for a second. I'm actually speaking out of a work of God that the Lord has done in my own life. And, and I am just inviting you into this today. And I, I wanna ask you today, how are you and Jesus? When you strip it all away, when the four services I preach on Sunday are done, when I'm alone by myself in the car or at home or in the office, when there's nothing else and there's nobody else, how am I and Jesus? Really, what does your walk with him look like today? How close are you? You know, I heard Keith Jenkins say that we need a word from the Lord. I heard Nicole of the Rock say that for Backyard Revival, the Lord spoke to her. Randy talked about how we need to be unique in who God has called us to be. And Brandon, besides talking about sourdough yesterday, he mentioned visions and dreams. And I wanna tell you today that the world is hungry for truth. But, but not just truth as a general concept, but the person that that truth leads to, and this is Jesus. This is why we don't just preach the word, we are preaching Jesus to people. But how do we preach Jesus if we don't hear Jesus? Spend time with Jesus, meet with Jesus, listen to Jesus. How do we lead in Jesus' ways if we do not sit at the feet of Jesus? And I believe God is calling us to a radical simplicity of knowing him and following him wherever he leads us. And I didn't mention Aaron in my list of preachers, but if I did, I'd just repeat his entire message right now. One amazing word of God that he just brought to us. And so this is why I had you ask the question, have you heard? Have you heard? What is Jesus speaking to you? In Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, Jesus says these words. He says, and I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. Every idle word, that, that word idle in the Greek literally means to be free from labor, to be lazy. In other words, words that come out of our mouths that have not had work put into them. There has been no investment in the process of where those words are coming from. And I wanna go to 1 Samuel chapter three today. And so many of you know this story already and um, the story of Samuel when he first hears the voice of the Lord. I, I wanna start real quick in verse 19 and then we'll go to the beginning. It says this, as Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and everything Samuel said proved to be, what's that last word right there? Reliable in, in, in the Hebrew and some translations say this, that, that his words did not fall to the ground. And, 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 and the reality of that idea that that fall in, in, the, in the Hebrew is not just a random falling like you knock a can over or, or you, know, you drop something accidentally. The idea of falling here in that his words did not fall to the ground is actually somebody who prostr prostrates themselves or, or an intentional falling, a moving to the ground, that there is a force to the fall and, and what it's being spoken about is that Samuel, he, he had a force as well, but the force of his words were not directed towards the ground being lost forever. They were directed towards people. And as a result of this, Samuel was a man who anointed kings, who spoke the word of God, who saw lives changed and idols torn down. His words were not lost but they were words that were powerful in God for all that God desired to do. And I don't know about you, but 
but I would like to speak like that. Any here, anybody here in the room that wants to speak like that? That, that? that the words that you speak would find their place, as Isaiah says, that, that when God sends his word, it always accomplishes the purpose for which it was sent. I, I want to speak in a way that it actually accomplishes the purposes of God. So how do we speak like this? How do we speak like this? Well, the key is right there in verse 19. It says, the Lord was with him. And I promise you, before Randy gave his message on, on Monday night, I, I had in my notes, this is the key. And he said it. So maybe he stole it from me. I don't know. Uh, but, but the Lord was with him. That, that we would be a people that are walking so closely with Jesus that everything that comes out of us would reflect our Savior. And I believe the Lord has had a thread here going on at Connection this year. And I noticed it from the first night, and then I actually sent a message to Aaron. I said, everybody's still in our messages. No, they're not, but, but God is speaking something to us. So let's go to the beginning, 1 Samuel chapter 3. Right at the very beginning in verse 1, it says, Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. Now in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare. And visions were quite uncommon. In fact, uh, some versions say that the messages or the word of God was, was precious. In the Hebrew, it means weighty, that, that it carried a lot of weight because there wasn't a whole lot of it. And so if there was a word from God, it, it, it carried weight because people were going, that there's not enough to go around. And unfortunately, Eli had missed the opportunity to be who God wanted him to be. He, he was the man that the God had, had appointed to be used so that way the people of Israel would hear the voice of the Lord. But while Eli was alive, the voice of the Lord was not being heard, but not because God stopped speaking. God is always speaking. And so Samuel was there with him serving the Lord. It says, one night Eli, who was almost blind by now, had gone to bed. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel, I love this, was sleeping in the tabernacle near the ark of God. You, you already see Samuel as a little kid going, I, I'm gonna snuggle up against the curtain. I'm gonna get as close to the ark as I possibly can. I wanna be as close to the presence of God as possible. And he's right there, right next to it. And it says, suddenly, the Lord called out, Samuel. Yes, Samuel replied, what is it? He got up and ran to Eli. I love this idea of Samuel just immediately runs. We see a servant who is ready to respond so quickly to the call. And by the way, Samuel didn't think he was responding to God. He thought he was responding to Eli. I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go back to bed. So he did, verse six. Then the Lord called out again, Samuel. Again, Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, my son, Eli said. Go back to bed. Samuel did not yet know the Lord because he had never had a message from the Lord before. Hmm. And how many do not yet know the Lord in our world today because they've heard a lot of messages but they have not heard the message that the Lord is sending. So the Lord called a third time and once more Samuel got up and went to Eli, here I am, did you call me? Then Eli realized it was the Lord who was calling the boy. Imagine that, Eli was so off of it that it took him three times to figure out that it was the Lord calling Samuel. So he said to Samuel, go, 
and lie down again. And if someone calls again, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed. And then it says in verse 10, and the Lord came. Can you repeat those four words with me? And the Lord came. It doesn't say that in any other verse. This fourth time, the Lord literally comes. In the Hebrew, it literally means came, stood. God stood there and called to Samuel. God wants to be present with us. The other times he called, he called, but this time he was present. He stood there and called to Samuel. You know, it makes me think all of this about the disciples who were spending their time sleeping when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. But even Samuel, who was asleep, had an inclination to hear the Lord's voice and respond to it. He was physically asleep, but, but not spiritually. And then in verse 11, it says this, and the Lord said to Samuel, I am about to do a shocking thing in Israel. I am going to carry out all my threats against Eli and his family from beginning to end. I have warned him that judgment is coming upon his family forever because his sons are blaspheming God and he hasn't disciplined them. So I have vowed that the sins of Eli and his sons will never be forgiven by sacrifices or offerings. I don't know about you, but if I'm gonna get my first message from God, that is not the first message I wanna hear. I mean, I, I like to hear God come up and say like, I love you so much, Jeff. Oh, you're my son with whom I am well pleased. But the first message that Samuel gets is God's punishment on Eli's family. What do you do with that? I mean, think about it for a second. Because we know how to share the easy words. Oh, the Lord spoke this to me and it was so wonderful and it was just such a precious time with the Lord and, and, and it, that's easy to share. But this? And Samuel's a child and Eli's his mentor and he's grown up with him, this? And in verse 15, it says Samuel stayed in bed until morning it doesn't say he went back to sleep. <laughs> By the way, I just realized that right now. It wasn't in the notes. <laughs> then he got up and opened the doors of the tabernacle as usual. He was afraid to tell Eli what the Lord had said to him. He was afraid to tell Eli what the Lord had said to him, you know, the Lord is speaking, but there's a boldness that is required to be willing to step up and speak that which the Lord is saying. And um, I want to invite you today to choose to enter in to a lifestyle of hearing the voice of the Lord but having the boldness to speak that which he is telling you to say. And, and, and I gotta tell you because in my own personal journey, I, I, I went through a season where, where I was really worried about the words I would use and, and the way I would speak because I didn't wanna offend anybody, I didn't wanna hurt anybody. Obviously, we want to treat people well, but I'm not talking about that. I, I didn't want to speak in such a way that might turn some people off because I, I, I'm worried about the numbers and I'm worried about the finances and I'm worried about all of these things. Am I the only one? But there is a trust that comes in the Lord that if you would speak what he has told you to speak, that if you trust him, you know that he will build the church, that he will do the work that he has called you to do. And so, in verse 16 it says, but Eli called out to him, Samuel, my son, and he says, 
here am I. I I think this is really interesting because all the other three times, he said, here am I, did you call me? This time he only said, here am I. He's like, if I can get away without saying anything, that would be great. And in verse 17, it says this. What did the Lord say to you? Tell me everything. And may God strike you and even kill you if you hide anything from me. What? I had to sit there for a minute and think about that verse. Like what in the world? Well, why would Eli say something so drastic to Samuel? saying, if you don't tell me, may the Lord kill you. And, and, and the best I can figure it, and I, I'm really here just kind of suggesting this to you, is that Eli was going, Samuel, I missed it. I've lived my entire life not hearing his word and proclaiming his word. I missed it, and I don't want you to live the rest of your life like I have. So may the Lord take you now rather than living an entire life of not having the boldness to speak that which I have told you to say. He might as well take you home, but if you're gonna be on this earth, then speak what the Lord has told you. So Samuel told Eli everything. He didn't hold anything back. May we not hold anything back of that which the Lord has spoken to us. And let me be clear, there's a lot of people that are bold that aren't speaking the word of God. There's a whole lot of those people. But, But I want to be a person that when the Lord does speak, I am bold enough to not hold anything back, but to say, God, if you said it, I'll say it. And so he didn't hold anything back. You know, I'm I'm reminded about so many incredible stories. Elijah on Mount Carmel and years ago, I I wondered how was it that Elijah decided to do something so crazy as to confront hundreds of the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel asking God to send fire from heaven until I realized one day in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 36, that when he is praying for God to send fire, he actually says these types of words. He says, God let everybody know that I am doing this at your command. It means that he had heard the Lord speaking to him And the Lord had told him to do that. And then he stepped out in boldness to do what the Lord had told him to do. I'm reminded about Jesus in John chapter 5 verse 19 where he says that I see what the Father does. I do what I see the Father doing. It's so interesting that in verse 1 of this chapter it says in those days messages were rare and visions were quite uncommon. But I believe the Lord is raising up a generation of people who know how to listen to his voice and to see what he is doing and to go out and follow. You know, I was 19 years old when God spoke to me and told me to learn Spanish. I was walking to a class at the university and he spoke very clearly to me and I said, okay, I don't know how I'm gonna do that, but sounds good. And um, a little while later, started dating my wife, Evelyn, who's here with our kids. This year, we just uh, completed 20 years of marriage. And um, I, I like telling my church that I'm more Hispanic than all of them since I have five kids. But um, the reality is, is that God spoke this to me. And then my dad, 
uh, Jim Tully started a Spanish-speaking congregation in, in Los Angeles in 1999, and I immediately knew that God had called me to go and, and serve with him in that season. He eventually became the youth pastor of a large, growing church. But I remember that in the very beginning, a month into the church, a story that my dad said of how he was standing in front of the little chapel that we were meeting in, and he was just standing there asking the Lord what to do. No model, no method, no strategy, no nothing. Just hear from the Lord and see what he says. And while he was standing there, a, a woman came by pushing a stroller with her little baby, and the Lord said to my dad, you're going to do a blessing of the children. And two months later, at this little small church of 60 people, we did a blessing of the ch children and attendance doubled that day and many people were blessed and then the church just exploded from that. And we kept on doing it. And oh, other pastors would take that and go, well, I'm going to grow my church. This is a good methodology. I'll do a blessing of the children. And the only problem is it worked for some, but not for all. Why? Because it wasn't Rema for everybody. It was the Lord, what the Lord spoke to him to do. And that's why it worked for him. And so everybody's out here grasping from a bunch of different places to get what they need. But I want to tell you today that if you would just walk closely with Jesus, he will give you all that you need for life for family, for walking with him, for ministry, for all of it. And this is it. And if you want four points here, we go, I know everybody does three, but we're four squares. So four, four real quick. I, I think we have them on the screen. Uh, have a servant's heart, number one. Number two, a listening ear. Number three, a quick response. And number four, a boldness to speak. There you go. Those are the four points. Done. Finished. And I am out of time, but I want to tell you this, you have a voice. And that voice might be meant for 50 people, for 10 people, 100 people, 1,000, 10,000. I have no idea what that number is. I would like to release you from the pressure of believing that that number is some number that society has defined for you. But to believe that God has called you to who he has called you to at your church, in a prison, in a park, wherever he has called you, the number, the place doesn't matter, but your voice is given to you by God and it is meant to be stewarded. There are people that will, you will influence that no one else will at the level that you will do it. And I don't know about you, but I want my voice to reflect God's voice. Let me finish with, with this story. I um, went through a season in ministry as a senior pastor. I, I was enjoying my time as a youth pastor. I was really walking in my calling, walking in my identity. The Lord was doing some incredible things, and we raised up hundreds of leaders, and, and, and it was an amazing season. And then when the Lord called my wife and I to plant a church, we, we, we planted, and uh, um, uh, Randy did a Disney wedding, so everybody knows, I, I did a MySpace wedding. Um, I don't know if I should admit to that in front of everybody, but, um, but we, we, we were in the beginning of our ministry and things were good, but I got to a point where I was stressed and I was burdened and I was lacking confidence. I was lacking trust in God. I was wondering what was going to happen, where the money was going to come from because the rent had to be paid every month and I needed food to put on the table for my family. And all those things were happening. And I got to tell you that I spent a few years spinning my wheels looking at every method, reading every resource, going to all the trainings, doing everything I possibly could. And can I just tell you that none of it works for me? None of it. Until one day, the Lord captured my heart. And I went and decided to live a different type of life than what I was living before. And I started getting into the word every single day spending time in prayer every single day and saying, Lord, I'm just going to do what you tell me to do. And can I just tell you that regardless of numbers, regardless of ministry impact, regardless of anything else, my life 
for years now has been blessed by simply listening to the voice of the Lord and following what he is telling me to do. And I want to release you from the pressure of having to listen to a thousand voices. Would you just become an expert in listening to the voice of Jesus? Become an expert in that. Would you stand up with me right now? We're going to sing. Um, I'd like to, if we could, just maybe the chorus of make room. I, I will make room for you. Yeah.
Pastor Jeff and I, we discern from the Spirit that it's time to respond. And maybe this is a moment where we can become that prayer. When I shared earlier how the Lord spoke to me about Melissa and I going to Tallahassee to plant a church, and you know, He said, "Soon I will send you to a place you have not seen, and to a people that you do not know." But the context of hearing the Lord was actually, for me, a moment of silence. I was driving back from Restoration Church to our house in the Jeep, top down, but God said, turn the music off and get still. And it was from the silence the Holy Spirit spoke that word to my heart. And we want to invite you as a family to collectively make room. We're going to spend a few moments in utter silence in the presence of God. As Pastor Jeff said, to truly posture and position ourselves to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to us individually and collectively as a family. For us to hear God's voice loudly, clearly, and prophetically, we must position and posture ourselves humbly, quietly, and patiently. So whatever your posture is, it's maybe sitting down, hitting your knees, going to the side of the wall. As a family, let's hear God. Speak, Holy Spirit. Your sons and daughters are listening.
used as a corporate body. We're so grateful for your voice. Lord, we thank you, Lord. I'm going to invite you to stand with me in this moment. Lord spoke to you right now, would you raise up a hand? Just raise up a hand. Hands all over the room. We just spent over five minutes in silence before the Lord. You can put that hand down. And for some, this was uncomfortable. For some, it's normal. But I think it would be amazing if it becomes normal for all of us. Amen. And um, the disciples in the book of Acts, after, after they suffered some persecution, they got together and were praying again. And they said, in their prayer, they, they, they said, not that the Lord would stop the persecution, not that the Lord would keep them from harm. Their prayer was that the Lord would give them boldness to continue speaking. And so as we have listened to the Lord in these moments, whether your word is a personal one, private, a corporate one for your church that you lead or are involved in, one for your family, or one for our Foursquare family, I want to pray that you would have the boldness to speak that word. So Jesus, today, not with loud voices, no, but with a simple, humble spirit, we say, Lord, would you give us Holy Spirit boldness? Yes, Jesus. Not one based off of emotions as those are fleeting, but something in the deep, the core of our being that knows that we know that we know that you have spoken and you have called us to respond. And so Jesus, I pray that you would place that boldness in every heart, in every mind, in every soul. Yes, God. That everything in us would align with what you have spoken to us, with what you have shown us, and that we would walk it out, act it out, speak it out. Not partially, not 50%, but totally, 100% of that which you are calling us to do. So, Lord, we extend our hands, and may you, Holy Spirit, pour out fresh anointing and boldness to speak what you have called us to speak and to do what you have called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you guys.